this it has failed. You... This is a problem of their own making, and they, they just need to address it. The NHS is on the table. Buongiorno, freaks and geeks. Despite being a massive fanboy of the Resident Evil franchise, it might come as a surprise to you that I do love the occasional soppy inspirational health quote. Healthy outside starts from the inside. Health is not valued until sickness comes. The first wealth is health. Even avid cigar sucker and full-time racist Winston Churchill agreed health was important when he came out and said, healthy citizens are the greatest asset any country can have. But something tells me he only said this because he needed strong soldiers to go out and colonize more lands. But that's beside the point. So why do I get the feeling that today's right wing leaders see having good health as conditional, like owning an iPhone or keeping access to the Netflix account after breaking up with your partner? Safe accommodation, good health care and school education. Apparently only one of these is a human right in the global north. I believe it should be all three. Apart from the fact we all just lived through a global traumatic event called the COVID-19 pandemic. This video was inspired by the strong suspicion that the UK's current government is racing towards privatisation of the NHS. Like they don't want to miss out on it as the supermarket Black Friday deal. Also I found an opinion piece found on the BMJ website written by Nicholas. Nicholas? Freudenberg. A distinguished professor of public health at the City University of New York School of Public Health, who also authored the book At What Cost? Modern Capitalism and the Future of Health. So I wanted to look at the healthcare system in the UK, why today's neoliberals are a threat to the NHS, where we could be heading. The cost of that hour for me to just keep the office open and operating is about $300. And what a great healthcare system looks like. They treat everything from motorcycle accidents to pregnancies. Both the doctor and the medicines are free. But the government says that 35%, which the BMA want, is just completely unrealistic. An NHS that is letting patients down once more as junior doctors walk out for a historic four-day strike while demanding an unreasonable and unrealistic 35% pay hike. But that's a problem of their own making. In 2016, Jeremy Hunt, the now Chancellor, was in charge of the strikes then, and he didn't increase pay. He hasn't increased pay since then. The 35% has come because for the last 10, 15 years, they've not made any changes. That said, the health secretary, Steve Barclay, is right not to be held to ransom, given the unhinged demands and revolting threats to our lives thanks to decisions made by the Marxist BMA Health Union. We don't want to be on strike today. We don't want we don't want to be here, we want to be at a hospital helping patients. And we can't because it costs us more to come to work and pay for childcare when we're doing a night shift and we're working a weekend than it, than it does, than we earn money. And that, that, that can't work, that, that, won't, that won't work. If I was to describe the healthcare system in the UK at the moment in one word, the word I would use is I could sit here for the next hour explaining how it is underfunded, understaffed, and a needlessly overcomplicated entity that hates sharing vital information with their local partners and even their own patients. Why was it easier for me to obtain a gold Amex card than it was my own medical records? And my credit score is actual dog sh Couple this with the fact we have four healthcare systems doing their own things. NHS England, NHS Scotland, NHS Wales, and health and social care in Northern Ireland. What the f 
was. <laughs> Did nobody tell Northern Ireland about the uniformed names? What was that? It would be a national health service if it was a unified island. To be fair, I totally agree, that should happen. Anyway, the National Health Service in the UK was created after the Second World War in 1948 by Clement Attlee's Labour government. So Keir Starmer here thinking about doing something half as progressive. This was followed by the Scandinavian countries launching their own universal healthcare systems. Sweden, Iceland, Norway, Denmark and Finland all stepped forward too. These healthcare systems were all set up as a response to World War II. The irony being the first country to implement anything resembling a national health insurance system was Germany in 1883. God damn. I mean, there are a thousand better ways Germany could have spread the benefits of a government looking after their sick. Anyway, since its inception, the NHS has seen 17 different people become prime minister, 12 Tories and five Labour. However, this latest spree of five Tory prime ministers has finally brought the NHS to its knees. An institution even war-hungry, apartheid-loving Margaret Thatcher never had the audacity to touch. But in her defence, at the time, she had a lot on her plate domestically. Maggie was too busy taking milk from children, selling off council homes and cracking union skulls. Cameron, May, Johnson, Truss and Sunak. Each one more stupid than the last but each one sharing the singular goal of fully privatizing the National Health Service. What I have here is something I can reveal to you. These uncensored documents leave Boris Johnson's denials in absolute tatters. Is the NHS safe in Boris Johnson's hands? We've now got evidence that under Boris Johnson, the NHS is on the table and will be up for sale. This is not only a plot against our NHS, it's a plot against the whole country. These sellout negotiations with Trump cover everything from food safety to gender discrimination rules to workers' rights. The further we move from the 2019 general election, the more I realised the jam maker wasn't as bad as everyone was saying. But why is it important that we have a healthcare system that is kept far, far away from the sticky fingers of greedy capitalists? Firstly, nobody should make profit from the health of another human being. Mega corporations see Johnson's alliance with Trump as a chance to make billions from the illness and sickness of people in this country. Secondly, because fuck them, that's why. Even radical liberal Mr. James O'Brien could tell you how to privatise a beloved public service. Your government underfunds and cuts to the point where everyone is so unhappy with a service. Privatisation resembles a knight in shining armour. Living in the imperial core means you are fed a daily diet of a private market leads to competition, innovation and value for money to the customer. But they never tell you once a monopoly is established, you are more than by that private market you love so much. Wait until Amazon wipes out every independent business on the planet. That plug extension will then cost you £300. This is not to say privatisation is new to the NHS. Private finance initiatives or PFI for short were created by Conservative Prime Minister Jean Major in 1992. As you can imagine, leader of the Socialist Labour Party, Tony Blair, immediately axed PFIs as soon as he was elected in 1997. Psych. Tony Blair, the man that gets boners from bombing brown people, actually expanded the policy to the point Margaret Thatcher was proud of him. Apparently, PFIs are a means for increasing accountability and efficiency for public spending by hiding the money behind the veil of British company law. Makes perfect sense. The National Audit Office felt the PFIs provided good value for money overall. What the fuck? I'm losing my mind over here. I just find it absolutely delightful when a government body gives me the vibes of a project, as opposed to the facts and figures. Forgive me if I'm a bit suspicious of private firms being handed contracts to complete and manage public projects. 
Just look at this list of 50 English hospitals procured under a PFI contract. Every single one of them exceeding 50 million pounds in capital costs. That is just crazy. Anyway, putting the absurdity of PFIs to one side, what does the public think of the current NHS? They must surely be celebrating the increasing role private companies are playing within the NHS. Actually, satisfaction is at a 25 year low. <laughs> So why does the public keep voting in a political party that is openly hostile to the idea of public ownership? That is another video for another day. Anyway, look at this graph where participants were asked, all in all, how satisfied or dissatisfied would you say you are with the way in which the National Health Service runs nowadays? We can see dissatisfaction increased under Maggie, reaching those nosebleed numbers of 50% under John Major. Despite the many faults of New Labour, they were able to bring dissatisfaction levels down to below 20% in 2011, and satisfaction rates reached 70% at the same time. Now dissatisfaction numbers are at 41% with satisfaction at 36%. Obviously this doesn't provide the full picture by any means, but it cannot be discounted. With the public not exactly happy, how has Brexit, Brexit has failed and underfunding impacted the staff? Well, junior doctors are threatening to strike for the next year and nurses are taking action over low pay. In fact, Wikipedia has a page dedicated to NHS strike action. Austerity has led to staff shortages and underpayment of the staff that have remained, which means waiting two weeks for a GP appointment, patients sitting in A&E for six hours, and stroke victims being left to linger for 93 minutes before the arrival of an ambulance. And before I get started on the blatant medical racism, can someone please explain to me in simple terms how a fully privatized healthcare system will fix any of these problems, unless you happen to be insanely rich. But maybe I'm just focusing on the wrong issues. Perhaps it is the burden of having actual freedom under capitalism that is truly damaging to your health. Strictly speaking, the system of capitalism is damaging to your health. And if you don't believe me, this guy with the gigantic brain would concur. So I'll use this section of the video to give an overview of the Nicholas Freudenberg opinion blog. But I still encourage you to read the article yourself. Nicholas uses this article to heavily imply that capitalism isn't that bad. But we should definitely take a closer look at it because it can be reformed. Or we could put mechanisms in place to stop the worst excesses of capitalism affecting health outcomes. But I get the impression Nicholas is saying this because he knows he would get blackballed if he came out and screamed, Boo! Boo! Capitalism is a bag of elephant dicks. So instead, Nicholas is doing the equivalent of telling the nice police officer, Listen, I know this dangerous, bloodthirsty dog has bit a fifth child. But this muzzle will provide all the protection we need from this point forward. Instead of saying, No time to waste, we have to throw Satan's dog into the incinerator. For me, capitalism cannot be reformed to the point where our health is safe. So maybe it's a good idea to move on to the next financial system. How much more evidence needs to be presented? Modern day capitalism is adding to the global burden of disease by denying over 2 billion people around the world access to their first dose of the COVID vaccine. Ultra processed food is being shoved down our throats in pursuit of shareholder returns, resulting in poor diet being the leading factor in premature deaths and preventable illnesses. You don't need me telling you about the effects of income inequality around the world on health. And this feature of capitalism has only increased since the COVID pandemic. Please excuse me as I laugh at this blatant act of sports washing. Fossil fuel company Shell has gone into partnership with British Cycling. Thank God the ink has dried on that deal to enable people to ride their shiny bikes in circles in 12 feet of water. I'm sure it will help all those climate refugees sleep at night. Nicholas means well with this blog, but everything in a capitalist structure is up for negotiation. If Nicholas bothered to advocate for policies in this article, they would have been watered down to the 
point where the status quo would have continued. This blog was less Karl Marx bursting through the door, two guns up, and more Barack Obama pleading yes we can, but only if the enemy takes pity on us. This article was so zoomed out, looking at climate change, gun violence, the promotion of alcohol, tobacco, unhealthy food and firearms. Without mentioning these things cannot be regulated under capitalism because they are core tenets of capitalism, especially within the good old US of A. If I asked you to close your eyes and imagine the pinnacle of capitalist healthcare, I'm guessing apple pies and gun shows would also spring to mind. The USA motto is, we are number one. But outside of prison population and school shootings, this decoration is mostly empty. It's also hard to take a country seriously where the majority of people only use the healthcare system if absolutely necessary for fear of going bankrupt. How can you claim to be the richest country in the history of the planet and not have the top five reasons people go bankrupt be loss of income, medical expenses, unaffordable mortgage, overspending and providing financial assistance. Even figures from August 2022 show that 17% of adults with healthcare debt had to declare bankruptcy or lose their home. What a beautiful American motto, be rich or get sick and become homeless. The rest of the world needs to step its shit up and get on this level. Can you believe? No one goes bankrupt in Germany because of medical care costs. It's an absolute disgrace and probably the main reason they lost two world wars and four World Cup football finals. Patriotic Americans seeing a study claim 62% of bankruptcies were caused by medical issues and say, Boy, that's freedom right there. But letting a man take a knee during the national anthem is a line crossed and he has to be labelled a soldier-hating, race-baiting communist. I really don't understand how free healthcare isn't good capitalism. If your lowest paid workforce have free medical care, they are more likely to seek help while their illness is still manageable, which means they can continue to attend work and the owners can continue to steal surplus value. But my commie brain failed to notice the reserve army of labor in America is limitless and lacks solidarity. With all of this evidence freely accessible, the Tories in the UK are still determined to implement the same system here. A system that glees at the thought of putting a family into debt for five generations. America is the biggest global economy, has control of its own borders and is not part of any supranational political and economic union, has never felt the effects of sanctions. Yet homelessness in major cities are commonplace and tap water could kill you if you dare to drink it. But what does healthcare look like in a country where there is no profit motive? What does healthcare look like in a country that has been under a US embargo for 60 years? which has cost Cuba over $130 billion in damages. Taking into consideration the information just shared, it could be safe to assume the healthcare in sanction hit Karl Marx love in Cuba would be absolutely shocking. Cuba is an island nation with a population of 11 million people. Situated in the Caribbean Sea, it has the second highest population in the Caribbean after Haiti. Despite being under US sanctions for 60 years, they still perform better than other countries in the region on infant mortality and life expectancy. According to the latest figures from the World Bank, Cuba's life expectancy at birth is only two years behind that of the United States. How convenient is that? Wow. That shit is crazy, but you love to see it. The Cuban government operates the national health system and assumes fiscal and administrative responsibility for the health care of all its citizens and some Americans, but more on that later. Despite crippling sanctions and without the support of the Soviet Union, in 2005, Cuba had 627 physicians per 100,000 population, UK had 230 physicians per 100,000 population, 
and the United States had 225 physicians per 100,000 population. I'm going to collapse. World class when it comes to preventative medical care, Cuba has placed teams made up of physicians and nurses directly in the communities they serve and are made available 24 hours per day. In 2015, Cuba became the first country in the world to eliminate mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis. Clearly a heavyweight when it comes to healthcare, Cuba provides more medical personnel to the developing world than all the G8 countries combined, which is insane. Cuba has restored the eyesight of over 200,000 Venezuelans for free. That sh is making my hard. 20,000 health tourists from across the globe visit from Latin America, Europe, Canada, and the numbers are grown from the United States. Imagine it being cheaper to book a flight to Cuba and pay for a medical treatment there than it is to stay in your home country of America and buy eye surgery. God really said to America, pure embargo, watch these Cubans cook. Cuba has developed a lung cancer vaccine and successfully exports many medical products. Not for profit, but to keep the revolution alive despite interference from the most powerful country on the planet. In 2006, war criminal George Bush decided he wanted to see more Cuban people die. So he launched the Cuban Medical Professional Parole Program, called that to insinuate Cuban doctors were in prison. Someone should have told George that America imprisons the most people on the planet. And America loves prison so much that they set up Guantanamo Bay on Cuba. What the fuck? Anyway, this program allowed for any Cuban doctor serving outside of Cuba to be granted political asylum and permanent residence status in the United States if only the Cuban national was able to make it to a US embassy anywhere in the world. Only a demon would think this was a great policy to inflict on a country you already had an embargo against. Mercifully, this program was ended by war criminal Barack Obama, but it still lured 7,117 doctors away from Cuba. Which confuses me because I was always told that communism would fail by itself. The UK House of Commons Health Select Committee even traveled to Cuba and even provided a report that praised the success of the Cuban healthcare system based on its strong emphasis on disease prevention and commitment to the practice of medicine in the community. This happened in 2001. So why the f are we heading towards a privatized healthcare system? Capitalist healthcare leads to bankruptcy and death. Communist healthcare leads to cancer vaccines and restored eyesight. All while living under a 60 year embargo, not bad for a one party socialist state. There is a tweet that lives in my head rent free ever since I read it. Capitalism is a direct threat to your life. Don't want to play, then you'll be homeless. Don't want to stay in corporate America and suffer without health care. Don't want to fund immoral wars and corporations? Go to jail. Life under capitalism is non-stop threats to comply. If you are the type of person to see the hammer and sickle in the name and automatically switch off, I can't help you. If your immediate response is, what about Stalin's Russia? I cannot help you. But if you are the kind of individual that wants to engage with the argument in good faith, please tell me why this tweet is so wrong. How is this an inaccurate description of late stage capitalism? For me, this is the current landscape in America and this Tory government is hell bent on bringing that to the UK. Not that Sir Keir Rodney Starmer is providing details on what he would do differently. So yes, I think 35% is unaffordable, but that's not an excuse to sit on your hands and do nothing. That's a reason to get in the room and negotiate and that's what the government should be doing. I cannot provide concrete evidence of Labour defending the NHS from the creeping spectre of privatisation. But I can show you that each Tory Prime Minister since Gordon Brown has tried their very best to satisfy their bloodlust with an escalation of demonic actions. And it's hard to tell whether these demonic actions were done deliberately or negligently. David Cameron, pig f and harasser of the homeless in his youth, believed disabled people were fine to sacrifice in the pursuit 
of the politically motivated austerity policy. Theresa May, Vicar's daughter and worst Margaret Thatcher tribute act in history, murdered any reputation any future UK Prime Minister could have with any future American President and killed the song Dancing Queen with her involuntary body movements. Boris Johnson, the waitrose bag full of custard with a blonde wig stapled to the top, tried to single-handedly destroy the healthcare industry by erasing all residents with the COVID virus. Liz Truss, socialist sleeper agent with an inability to leave a room she entered of her own free will, whacked the pound with the worst budget announcements in history and possibly Queen Elizabeth II with a handshake. Rishi Sunak, tax dodging billionaire played by Will McKenzie in Brownface, has given the green light to concentration camps in Rwanda for refugees. And an immigration bill that targets peaceful protests and the Roma gypsy traveller community. You wouldn't trust these people with your goldfish, so why would you trust them with your health and the NHS? I'm trying my hardest to be an optimist, but ignoring the evidence of their behaviour would make me delusional. For me, health is a human right and should be protected by government. If nothing else, a healthy nation keeps a capitalist economy together. <laughs> I understand that this video focused on physical health, but I believe mental and emotional well-being under capitalism is just as important and under as much danger, but it would require a separate dedicated video. So until that is possible, I would recommend you read the article by Nicholas Freudenberg and look at all the other links I provided in the description below. Yeah, so I really wanted to make this video because the 5th of July, I believe, marks the 75th birthday of the NHS. And I don't know how many more years the NHS will continue to be a national health service and not turned into a national insurance service or just a full-blown American style healthcare system whereby you're only granted healthcare if you're employed or you're just you're just really rich. It's, it's like proper disgusting when I actually think about it. Um, I am a massive advocate of not only free healthcare but the hard work, um, doctors, nurses, cleaners, everyone associated like cooks everyone associated with the nhs like i think they should all be paid um just everything that they're worth and more because yeah i i i'm i'm sure you would agree that we need more nurses and doctors and not more ceos like if a ceo if someone if thanos came back or <laughs> not came back if if thanos existed and he snapped away all of the CEOs in this country, you wouldn't notice. But if he if he existed and snapped away all the nurses, all the doctors, you would definitely notice. So that's why I am a massive advocate of the NHS. And yeah, I really enjoyed doing this video actually, like just looking at all the articles and all of the studies I was able to read, uh, especially when it comes to how much of a danger capitalism is to like your health and well-being well i know this video is more about your physical health but it definitely affects your emotional and mental well-being as well but just to stick with the theme of physical health um yeah it's a dangerous thing from whether it's the air we breathe um global warming climate change um, what they put in our foods that we don't know about um, all of this is done in the pursuit of increased profits for a tiny minority of people that exist on this planet um, yeah and I think the next big challenge for all of us is what is going to happen with climate refugees because as the planet gets hotter 
people, especially in um, sub-Saharan Africa, won't be able to grow crops and feed themselves. And there's no way these people are just going to think, think to themselves, okay, I'll just stay here and die. No, they're going to move north and they're going to come to Europe, whether, whether we want them or not. And I think we need to prepare, prepare for that, definitely. And if you don't want to prepare for that, then you should be advocating for policies to reverse the damage that climate change is and has done. Um, but yeah, that's just my my thoughts. I, I, I'll be really interested to, to see um, if you had any thoughts down below. Um, please, please, um, if you've listened up to this point, um, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really do appreciate it. And yeah, if you, if you feel that anyone else that you know in your life, whether it's family or friends, could benefit from watching this video, please forward it to them. I, that would do so much for me and I would really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure what the next video will be on. Um, I might just do a deep dive on how much capitalism hates the working class and unemployed people, but yeah that is a massive undertaking um but yeah we'll, we'll see um yeah again thank you if you listen up to this point please don't forget to like and subscribe um yeah leave me leave me a comment if you if you want to um and yeah i will see you um on the next one okay be safe out there